Hello and welcome to Tiny Code Christmas Day 10. Today we are going to be talking about structuring our code in a way that supports multiple effects that we can switch between based on the time. There isn't going to be any Pico 8 specific code section today as the code is incredibly similar. When we're finished with the code, we're going to talk about compression and packing our cartridges. So make sure you check out both parts of the video today. So we need to set up our program to handle multiple effects. And we're going to do this using if statements and the time. So an if statement is a piece of code that allows us to execute code conditionally. So we can check to see if the time reaches a certain value, run a certain piece of code. Now we have not actually needed to use an if statement that much, if at all, for any of the previous days. So I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to it in case you haven't seen it already. And it's the if keyword that we're going to use and we are going to put something in here to do with the time. So I have time assigned to a variable t above and I've just messed around with that to get something that moves fast enough so that we can use it for our, our demonstration here. And I am going to just say if t is greater than 2, then and I'm going to finish that off with end for now. I'll come back to it in a second. And I can put a bit of code in here and I'm going to put in uh, CLS 2. So um, when my program runs, I'm clearing the screen with 0. So CLS, the first line there. I'm setting up my time and I have an if statement and I'm saying if the time is greater than 2, whatever that value for time is, then clear the screen to color 2 and then end. So if I run this code, you will see that's what happens. Here at the bottom of the time printing out, that's going to help us debug any time related issues and just kind of get a sense for when we need to transition to the next effect. So this ran fine, the CLS worked, and as soon as it got to two, this if statement triggered and it colored the screen to two. Now it did both of them, it colored the screen up here and then it did it down here as well any time that this effect was triggered. So when we clean this up a bit, we won't need that CLS up at the top. So how would we add it conditionally so that that CLS only happens if there's, if that isn't true. So I'm going to remove the CLS from up here. And now I've modified my if statement to be an if else statement. So if t is greater than two, then run CLS two, else run CLS. So if I run this now, it's running the else, and now it's running the if part of it. Um, the So if this evaluates to true, if t is greater than two, it'll run the first block of code. Otherwise, it'll run the second block of code. And this is how we can continue to structure our effects by adding more if statements. As I said, this is one of the most straightforward ways of doing it, but there's plenty of other options out there that you can use. So let's add a third stage. And if t is greater than four, then CLS three. And I need to link these up so that they're all one statement, or they're all part of one if statement. And if t is greater than four, then clear the screen to three. Otherwise, else if it's greater than 2, then CLS 2, and then at the end, clear the screen. So you can see the way that we're layering them is designed so that they trigger in the right order. Um, it's going to start off at 0, and it'll trigger this one. By the time it gets to 2, it'll trigger this one. And when it's 4, it'll trigger this one. And we have to lay them out that way, because if I put the 2 above the 4, then the 4 will never trigger. So let's take a look at this, and we have 0. 2, 3, in terms of the, the colors being triggered. So how that's fine, and when I run it, we get that. That now stays at orange forever. So what can we do about it? So one of the easiest ways to make this wrap around again is to mod the time by, um, let's see, let's say 6. And if we take a look in the top left-hand corner, we can see that the time now goes up as far as six, stops, and resets. So that is a handy trick for getting your program to wrap around. Now I've picked out all these times. So I've said, I want this one, if it's uh, when the program has run for more than two, whatever uh, values for time, um, 
I want this effect when it's run for four, I want this effect, and and so on. So I'm going to now replace these. I'm going to get rid of um, my middle one, and I'm only going to have two of them. So I'm just going to have two effects here, and I am going to import them. And like any good cooking show, here's one I made earlier. Here is a tunnel. And here is a plasma. So let's take a look at this now. Plasma and tunnel. Okay, so let's make that a bit better. So I'm, I want um, 10 units of each so that means that the else will run um, when it hasn't reached 10 and then I'm going to mod this by 20 so we should get up to 10 up to 20 and it should start over again and again these are completely arbitrary numbers you'll figure out the feel for it I don't want this to be staring here at a screen for 20 seconds waiting for it to bring up the next effect and I now have multiple effects inside my program and you'll see that the the size, even if I get rid of these comments that I have here already, the size of these effects is 317. And there's a good bit of code that would have to be optimized to get it down to 256 characters. But if we run this through a packer, that will 100% be less than 256 bytes in a compressed cartridge. Now we could make some further optimizations to this. Um, for example, obviously we are using math dot a lot of a lot of places so we could alias that out we could rewrite our for loops here maybe and we could have it so that maybe we ran the plasma from minus 68 to 68 and the x from minus 120 to one to plus 120 and we could actually have only one loop and use our if statement in the center. Now obviously that has performance implications, but again, what doesn't? And it's up to us to make that choice of squashing the code versus performance. And so in that case, what you're doing is you're making a decision on which effect to run as the code is structured at the moment, you're making a decision on which effect to run once every time tick is called. The other way around, you'd be making a decision every iteration of the loop, but again, that might still be performant enough to give you a reduction in size. So these are the kind of things that you have to think about when you're structuring your code like this. And it's something that when we're working with nice small effects like this, and we're in the realms of 256 bytes, it's nice to just be able to pop an if statement or two in and sequence your effects like this. So now we're going to move on to the more technical aspects of compression and packing our codes. And now for the science bit. Today we're going to be talking about size coding techniques relating to the file size. So this is something a bit different to what we've been doing so far because both TIC80 and PICO8 have cartridge formats which have compression built into them. So we're going to talk about some techniques that will work specifically with that compression and we'll take a look at some general demo scene rules around file sizes. If you're entering a competition that has a file size requirement, for example, a 256 byte fantasy console competition, for example, one of the maybe one of the many love byte competitions coming up in February, what you will want to do is make sure that you're aware of the rules. So we've been working with text until now, but for these competitions, you have to submit the cart. And if you take a look at the carts you've been saving on the Pico 8 or the Tick 80, you'll notice that they're a lot bigger than the 256 bytes of text that's stored in that cart. That is in and of itself can present a bit of a problem because these platforms, Tick80 and Pico8, were adopted for size coding as opposed to created for size coding. So if you're entering any competition, make sure you check the rules of the competition for the size restrictions and any exceptions that there may be. So for example, some competitions allow you to exclude the headers from small size limit competitions. So for example, in a 64 byte tick 80 competition, I may be able to exclude the four byte header, meaning that I have 68 bytes to play with. 
So just a bit of terminology. So since we're talking about competitions, just a little bit of demo scene terminology for a second. What's a demo? So a demo is basically what you've been making. It's an audio visual program that demonstrates the technical ability of the people making it, the artistic ability, the musical ability, and all packaged into one thing. And again, it could be just code or it may be a combination of those things I mentioned. What's a production? Then a production is essentially the product that you are after making. So we talk about demo scene prods or productions. It is your your code, your demo. And what's an intro? So you'll often see a distinction between a demo competition and maybe an intro competition. And the general rule of thumb is that an intro competition is size restricted. Now, this could be something small like 64 bytes, or it could even be something substantially larger than that, but still be called an intro. This stems from the days of software piracy when everything was put on disks and there would be so little space left on the disk but yet somehow the people distributing the pirate copies would have enough room to put in some kind of a, an intro and these intros would have graphics greets shout outs sign scrollers all of those things and even though we're now making things called intros because they have a size restriction they're not actually an intro to anything so let's talk about the Pico 8. In Pico 8, you can export a code-only compressed file since Pico 8 version 0.2.4c. So that's from April 2022. So if you haven't updated your version of Pico 8, now would be a good time. And it requires the full version of Pico 8. This functionality is not available on the web educational version. You can export your code using the T-switch from the command line. So export minus T and then the name of your Pico 8 ROM. This saves only the code compressed as small as possible. And since August 2022, you can view the compressed bytes in real time as you code by control clicking on the compressed code capacity status bar down at the bottom. So Pico 8 uses a custom PXA compression format. And from what I can see, it does not transform the code. So it doesn't try and minimize your code. It leaves your code as is. And it just tries to find areas that are repeated in the code and it will essentially replace the repeated code with a reference back to the first point where it appears. There is a excellent application called PXAViz, which allows you to visualize the compression on your Pico 8 programs. And there's a link to that in the description. A lot of the character based size coding techniques are still valid in Pico 8 because the code isn't transformed or minimized by the, the ROM format. Aliasing function calls, for example, may not be beneficial anymore because the first time one of those long function calls appears it will just be referenced back to the first point so essentially you're trying to do the pxa's compression algorithms job for it another thing to make sure that you do since this is based on commonalities is rewrite um, any similar expression so if you have something for sign and something for cost for example um, so that the terms are as similar as possible for as many characters as possible so that you can take the entire first half of that equation and that will be referenced then from the second one. So now we'll take a look at TIC80. So TIC80 requires some external tooling to reduce our file sizes to a minimum. And the way TIC80 works is it has different chunks. It has a code chunk, it has sprites, it has music. And even if we don't have those things in our TIC80, they still exist in the cart. So there's tools called packers that are available. There's a few of them. So the first one and the one that I'm going to recommend that you try first is Pocketic um, or Packetic. I believe one of them is the correct Finnish pronunciation. And the second one is Pactic and then Tick Tool. These all have different strengths and weaknesses and it's worth trying them all out. I have used each one of these in different circumstances. And I've often used, for example, Tick Tool while developing and then Packetic for the final compression. So what did these packers actually do? They remove the unused chunks, sprites, music, etc. And they remove white space and they transform the code. So this is a one way operation. Um, you run the packer, it takes your code, removes the white space. It does the tick equals load trick. It will do all of these things that we've been kind of doing ourselves for the last while. And in some cases, it will do them a lot better than us. Packetic, for example, will use genetic algorithms to try and figure out which variable names are better and which um, expression formats compress better as well. These packers also will compress code using better algorithms. So the algorithms that are used are fairly standard. It's essentially the same as those used in a zip file, but 
you can put a lot of time into the compression of it and come up with some better heuristics for that that will result in a smaller file size. These packers then allow us to write reasonably readable code and not have to worry about minimizing the Lua ourselves. So Packetic is probably the easiest of these to install. It requires Python 3.9 or greater and it can be installed through pip. And if you have Python installed, you should have pip installed. And you can just, from the command line on your system, be it Windows, Linux, or Mac, you should be able to type pip install packetic, or depending on how your system is set up, you may have to use pip3 install packetic. Once installed through pip, you should be able to run packetic from your system command line as follows. And again, that's just the location to where your cart is. And you can find out where your tick80 carts are stored by typing folder into the tick80 command line. So there's a lot of command lines going on here. The stuff to do with packetic specifically goes on to your system command line and the folder goes on to the tick81 and that will print out where the folder is and then it will open it up as well as a bonus. So tick80 uses the deflate algorithm to compress its code and deflate is a combination of two different algorithms, LZ77 and then Huffman coding. So LZ77 finds segments of repeating code and replaces them with references to the original. This is generally over, like LZ77 has this concept of a sliding window and it has, um, but all of this doesn't really matter when we're dealing with size coding because all of our code is small enough to fit within that window where it's searching for re repetitions. And instead of just saving things with eight bits per character, the Huffman coding then essentially assigns less bits to more popular characters and then less used characters get more bits assigned to them. So the more you use a certain letter, the shorter that bit sequence becomes to represent it. So what does this mean? It means that things like aliasing s equals mat.sign are no longer necessary for using a packer. Uh, it means that we have to rewrite similar expressions so that the terms are similar for as many characters as possible. And again, you can give uh, packetic hints and it can rearrange things based on some guidance that you give it as well. And one thing that you can do is you can try to avoid introducing single use characters. So for example, two to the power of two might be better than, or two by two might be better than two to the power of two if you have used the multiplication sign before. It's worth reading the documentation for Packetic and that will give you an overview of the different types of transformations that it does. And it's, it does a huge amount and it's a really nice piece of software. And the last bit of advice is to pack early and often, get an idea of how your code is doing and see what optimizations you can make. You can output the optimized versions from Packetic as it's crunching and you can see what optimizations its algorithms have settled on. That's it for today, see you tomorrow.